I am called upon everywhere I go uh, to explain uh, what kind of name I have. When they hear that my name is S.M. Lockridge, they want to know what S.M., what, what is that for? And I tell them S.M. is for Shadrick Meshach. <laughs> and they really don't believe me. <laughs> and when I assure them that it is Shadrick Meshach, then they say, well, what happened to Abednego? <laughs> and I tell them I had to stop using Abednego because people misunderstood me. <laughs> they thought I was saying Shedrick Meshach and a bad Negro. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in Southwestern Seminary, my house burned, and the students started calling me Shedrick No Shack Locker. <laughs> As I said last night, Pastor, I'll always be thankful to you for inviting me here. Uh, I wondered, however, why you would choose me. You know, I'm like the fellow who was sent to give a death message. A man was killed in an automobile accident, and the witnesses at the scene knew his wife and knew that she was already sick and of the nervous type and whoever carried her this news was going to have to do it tactfully diplomatically they were going to have to ease it over to her so it wouldn't unduly upset her <laughs> they chose this man and told him what they wanted him to do gave him their address and when this man went to that address and rang the doorbell and the lady came to the door, he said, Are you Widow Smith? <laughs> she said, My name is Smith, but I'm not a widow. He said, that's what you think. <laughs> now, whoever thought that I could do justice to an occasion like this, that's what you think. <laughs> I'm happy to see uh, people of all walks of life, all ages. Uh, your presence here indicates that you are interested in your own salvation and in the salvation of others. You know, you can have a pocket full of pearls, but you'll not have a necklace until you get a string. Each one of us is a pearl in his or her own right. But we'll not be effective in our witnessing until we're strung together in Jesus Christ. Uh, tonight, uh, we turn to our Lord's Gospel according to Matthew, 6th chapter. And I'll begin reading with verse 5, Matthew 6, chapter, and verse 5. And when thou prayest, 
Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to use for a subject in this evening the last word in verse 13. Amen. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Amen. And now when it comes to preaching here at this church, I, I, I find it difficult to get started. You know, to get up to preach here is kind of like calling a business meeting after the rapture. But I'm going to do my best. Uh, now, a sermon should do at least four things for you. One, a sermon should stretch your mind. A sermon should inform and instruct you. You ought to be able to learn something from a sermon. Two, a sermon should tan your hide. <laughs> A sermon should correct you. Three, a sermon should warm your heart. It should inspire you. Four, a sermon should provoke the will. It should challenge you to do what the Lord would have you do. Every one of us has a check made out on the bank of heaven, but many fail to cash it at the window of prayer. Now prayer is man's job. 
That's the only unending obligation that our Lord has given to men. He did not say that men ought to always work. He did not say that men ought to always play. But men ought to always to pray. Pray for your personal life. Pray when you are successful, lest you become selfish. Pray when you're in sorrow, lest you become cynical. Pray when you are in prosperity, lest you become proud. Pray when you are in material poverty, lest you become spiritually poor, and that's the worst kind of poverty. In sin, a person declares his or her independence of God. In prayer, we declare our dependence upon God. Now, prayer is perplexingly paradoxical. That is, you have to pray in order to pray. When the disciples saw how lacking they were in prayer, they prayed. Lord, and notice they didn't say, Lord, teach us to preach. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to work miracles or teach us to be wise. But Lord, teach us to pray. When you recognize how lacking you are in prayer, you'll pray. You know, out of all of our Bible colleges, our seminaries, and uh, they, they have a little of courses that teach us a little of everything. Homiletics, hermeneutics, all the rest. But nobody offers a course in prayer. Simply because there's only one teacher. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And now some people think that prayer is a monologue. Where you do all the talk. And some of us talk to the Lord just like he doesn't know what's happening in this world. We talk to the Lord like we have to inform him, tell him what to do and how to do it and when to do it and you just right now, right now, Lord, right now. And some people talk to the Lord like they're picketing the throne of grace. <laughs> like the Lord is reluctant to answer. And you have to bombard his throne with prayer in order to get him to answer. Or he's reluctant to give you what you're asking for. We call him loud and long. Lord, come on now. <laughs> we want you to go here and go yonder. Do this and do that. And on the double. But prayer is not just a monologue where you do all the talk. Prayer has got to be a dialogue. Not only must you talk to the Lord, but you've got to wait 
and let him talk to you. Now it's far better for us to hear what the Lord has to say than it is for him to hear what we have to say. But we don't know what to say. We don't know what to ask for. Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright. Now praise for worship is due God. And that's the reason I'm so blessed by worshiping here with you. Praise for worship is due God. We are here tonight to glory in his grace to meditate on his might and his mercy and to put his praises before our petition. We are to put his praises before our petition. In other words, before you go on to ask the Lord for so much, thank him for what he's already doing. You know, we are good at counting bruises. Poor me, I have one here. I have one here. Instead of counting your bruises, Spend some time counting your blessings. Of course, I don't do too well with an accurate account because I soon get on shouting ground and lose the count. Instead of lamenting over what you've lost, thank God for what you have left. Pastor prayed tonight that this would be a thanksgiving service. And every time we go to God in prayer, we ought to first thank Him. Instead of numbering your enemies, thank God that you have some friends. And I, have, I thank Him that I have a friend above all others in Jesus Christ. You know, I used to whine and murmur and complain. Whenever I call myself praying, I'd go to the Lord telling him what's ailing me and uh, what uh, people are holding me down and uh, uh, people are mistreating me and it's so hard. And... <laughs> I go to him with a long list of negatives. But when I found Jesus, Precious to my soul, I moved off of Complaint Avenue, and I'm now living on Thanksgiving Boulevard. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Personal worship is due God. We have access to the throne of grace, and we can come unto God. You know, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that uh, I don't have to write back to Los Angeles and tell somebody what I want them to tell the Lord. You know, males are slow. And sometimes males get lost. And that fellow to whom I'm writing is waiting for me to send him a fee. <laughs> and I've got to wait for his answer. He's going to talk to the Lord and, and, and then write me back and tell me what the answer is. Whoa! Oh, excuse me, but uh, <laughs> let me tell you, I'm so glad that he's arranged it so that I can talk to him for myself. Now, I appreciate you praying for me. But when it comes to prayer, I don't trust you.
There's nobody can beat me talking to the Lord about me. We must worship with our whole heart and sincerely give thanks. Public worship is a privilege and a duty of redeemed souls united in faith and fellowship and the furtherance of the gospel. Don't you know it's a blessing just to be here? The Lord has given you the health and the strength to make it here. And then to sit there an hour and a half while I preach. That's a blessing. You know, sometimes, sometimes we've got some members, you have to keep them reminded. We have to call them. Don't forget to prayer meeting tonight. When, they, when, when, they, when you ask, when they, you tell them, or uh, invite them to come to the house of the Lord, the first thing you know, well, what, what's going on? Like something extra special has to go on before he puts in his appearance. Don't you know it's a blessing? just to be able to congregate here in the name of the Lord. Yeah. I'm having a good time tonight. Yeah. Let the assembly of the upright join together in praise and in prayer. Let the congregation of all who love and serve God join together at the mercy seat where they may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Prayer is a great privilege, I tell you. That's the reason David said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You know, if the Lord has redeemed you, if the Lord has saved you, the least you can do is say so. Everything I have above nothing, God gave it to me. And the least I can do is say so. Prayer is a great privilege, I tell you. Prayer is a weapon in the hour of conflict. It's a defense in the moment of peril. It's a retreat in the seasons of exhaustion. Oh, I said I was going to talk about amen. All right. Amen simply means that which is certain, that which is credible, that which is true. Amen simply means so be it, as it is in thy purpose, as it is in thy promises, so be it in our praises, so be it in our prayers. In the Old Testament, there are at least 30 references to Amen. And in the New Testament, there are at least 50 references to, to Amen. And in every one of these references, you'll find that amen is a word of affirmation. It has a force of a superlative, and it has a note of finality. When you said it, you have said it, and there's just nothing to top it. The best you can do is repeat it. And don't knock repetition. You know, every once in a while, maybe once or twice a year, I'll preach a sermon there at Calvary 
that I preached before. And invariably somebody comes charging up to me, Pastor, I, I heard that one before. And I said, yes, and if it didn't bear repeating, I shouldn't have preached it in the first place. Don't knock repetition. You see, there are no degrees of holiness. You know, God is just holy. He's not less holy one day and more holy another day. He's just holy. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, and each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy. And I get the idea that the one in the north cried, Holy. And the one in the south tried to find something to top him, he couldn't come up with it, and he cried, Holy. And the one in the east tried to find something better to say, and he couldn't find it, and he cried, Holy! The one in the west tried to find some to top, and he couldn't come up with it, and he cried, Holy! Holy is the Lord of hosts! I'm trying to tell you, don't knock repetition. We have an old spiritual that just says, Amen. Amen. And that's all. Just to, and about the third time around, things start happening. <laughs> don't, knock, don't knock repetition. And that's the reason we have a two-fold amen, and a four-fold, and a three-fold, and Sena has a seven-fold amen. And that doesn't mean five, six, seven, but it means without number and without end. Amen it simply means yes, Lord. And everybody here ought to say yes to the Lord. That means let the Lord have his way in your life. Just think what would happen here tonight. If every one of us would just let the Lord have His way, you know, we want our way, we want to do what somebody else told us to do, or say what somebody else told us to say, or sound like somebody else. If we would listen for the voice of the Lord, let him have his way. Why, revival would break out here tonight and spread throughout the length and breadth of this country. If you'll allow the Lord to let use you on his own terms and let the Lord have his way, you'll not only see what the Lord can do for you, but what he can do with you and through you. Now, nothing is going to happen through you until something happens to you. Until you let the Lord have his way. You know, we go to the Lord and every one of us, Lord, we want revival. Lord, we want a revival. Lord, send us revival. Lord, we want revival. The Lord is saying, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, you won't have to worry about revival. I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins, and I'll heal their land. It's our move now. God has already done everything that it takes for us to have revival. All we have to do is plug in.
<laughs> but that's it. We're reluctant to plug in. The moment we feel something coming on of a worshipful and a praise nature, we grab ourselves. I got to remember who I am now. Let the Lord have his way. Amen is an indication of solemn assent to the words of another on the part of an individual of congregation. Amen was used in the synagogue. And it is passed on to Christian congregation. It was customary to say amen at the giving of thanks. Our Lord used amen when he wished to vest a statement with special authority. He would often say, verily, verily, I say unto you, or truly, truly, I say unto you, or amen, amen, I say unto you. The title amen was given to our Lord in the epistle to the church at Laodicea. Paul preached about Christ, the Amen, the seal of God's promise. In all of these references, every time we hear one praising the Lord, we can't help but say Amen. If he's singing, we don't want to take the song, but you just want to let you know that's my song. You don't take the sermon, but you just uh, let you know if I was up there, I'd say the same thing. Uh, amen makes a doxology of what it is. Even when the scriptures are read, all of the people will say amen. As far back as Ezra's time, when the scriptures were read, all the people said amen. I don't mean some of them, all of them. You know, some of us think that amen is just for some people who don't know any better. But I've come to tell you, it's for people who do know better. You know, the first five years of my preaching ministry, I used to ask the congregation to say amen. When I'd walk in, I'd say, say amen, church. And then I'd say, say it again. But you know, I soon learned better than that. I don't want to encourage anybody to be a hypocrite. If you don't know what's going on, keep quiet. If the Lord is not your shepherd, don't play like he is. And another thing, if, uh, if the Lord is your shepherd, I won't have to ask you to say amen. Yeah, we think that... Amen is for people who don't know any better, but I say it's for people who do know better. When Paul was writing to the Corinthians and talking about spiritual gifts, he says, now the Lord is able to give each individual what he wants that individual to have. He'll give you something that he does not give me. And he'll give me something that he does not give you. Now just because you don't have what I have, don't knock it. But Paul zeroed in on those people who call themselves speaking in tongues. He said, now, I'm, I'm well aware that the Lord can give a person the power to speak another language 
on the spot. I'm not talking about some babbling. You don't know what you're talking about and uh, nobody else. And if you ask you what you're talking about, you get angry and talk about uh, you the devil. But I'm talking about another language, something that somebody else can understand. Why, if the Lord opened the mouth of a donkey and called him to speak, surely he can take a high school graduate and call him to speak. To Paul, Paul went on to say, but you people who call yourself speaking in tongues, if you're going to insist in speaking in tongues, Get you an interpreter. So how can these people say amen when they don't know what you're talking about? Amen is for people who know. Say if you don't know, keep quiet. No, uh, I heard a, no, a man say some time ago, there's no brother in our church that just says amen so loud and so frequently, it just turns me off. And I said to him, just because somebody else puts too much seasoning on his food, That isn't going to keep me from seasoning mine to my taste. Look, our sophistication is sapping the life out of our religion. You know, we work hard, especially when we come to church. We work hard at being dignified. Oh, our dignity comes down on the hard and heavy. <laughs> don't you know, don't you know, when you quench the spirit, you grieve the spirit. Amen will work anyway, if you'll allow it. In 1970, March 15th, I was one of the ten preachers from across this nation to be given an invitation by the President of the United States to be his guest in the White House. Now, I used to love to tell this before Watergate. <laughs> but at any rate, that Sunday morning, we were among 360 dignitaries from around the world, I'm talking about heads of state, to be invited to the worship service in the East Room of the White House. There was more dignity there per square inch than you could have found anywhere in the world. Dr. Billy Graham got to preaching that morning on the 23rd Psalm and he just kept hammering away on how good God is and how great he is and how gracious he is and there were two or three of us who stood it just about as long as we could. And we let loose with amen. And you know we had a shouting good time in the East Room of the White House. The next morning the Washington Post had its headlines, amen sounded in the White House. Didn't work anywhere. But, you know, some people try to, to justify themselves for not using it by saying, well, I don't know whether to say it at the beginning or in the middle or at the end. You know, I just like to sit and listen. I don't like to interrupt. Don't you know you can't interrupt a God-called preacher by saying amen? Amen. If you think you can, you try. <laughs> and then some will say, I would use it, but uh, 
I don't know whether to how whether to pronounce it amen or amen. You know, we can get so technical when it comes to things spiritual. But you're not misleading me. You know when to pronounce T-H-E, the, and when to pronounce it the. You know to say the east and the west. But what does it matter? The Lord is listening to how you pronounce your words. He's concerned about the condition of your heart. And then some will say, and I'm going on. Some will say, well, that's for people who don't know any better, and that's for people who just picked up something and it's just become a habit and and they, it would be better if they leave it all well I let's let's look at the word of the Lord and and see if it's all right to leave it all the Lord say when you pray I'm not talking about when you recite some words but when you pray, I'm not talking about going visiting and hear somebody say something in a prayer and it impressed the congregation that they responded affirmatively to it and you made a note of it and when you got back here, then you said that in your ear. He's not talking about that. He said, when you pray. I'm not talking about when you recite what you heard somebody else say. It sounds good. When you pray. You know, pray after this manner. And somebody gets tripped up right there. Then we start arguing. Somebody over here will say, the Lord just meant for us to recite these words verbatim and that's it. Somebody over here will say, no, he didn't mean that. He means for you to recite these words and then close out with something of your own. And then somebody over here will say, uh, no, he didn't mean that. He meant for you to start out with something of your own and then close out with these words. The Lord just say, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. After this manner. You know, when I was in elementary school, I was taught to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And then they gave me some problems. <laughs> and with uh, every set of problems, they give me some examples to show me how to work the problem. Now that didn't mean that all the numbers that I was going to encounter would be the same numbers that would be in that example. Well, whatever numbers I encounter, this is the way you work it. After this matter. And long about that same time we were taught letter writing. And we were taught that any good letter had to have at least six parts. We were taught that you had to have the name of the person to whom you're writing. In this prayer letter the name is Our Father. They, when you pray, you're going to have to pray Our Father. I'm going to have to pray for you and you're going to have to pray for me. Our Father. You know, if God is your Father, and He is my Father, that makes us brothers. <laughs> oh, a man's not going to accept another man as brother until he recognizes that they both have the same fault. <laughs> when you pray, Jesus said, 
you pray our Father. And then we were taught that you had to have the address of the one to whom you're writing, which art in heaven. And somebody, somebody gets the idea that God is sitting high, way somewhere, and got his feet propped up on earth for a footstool. You have to call him and tell him to come here and go yonder. Come here, Lord, and go out in California and see about my son. And go by the hospital. And don't forget that one over there that just had the accident. And that's that other fellow who has to go to and fro. God is already here. You know, we ask him to come on and be in the meeting. He's already here. <laughs> don't you know, don't you know, don't you know that distance doesn't refer to God. He's everywhere here. Satan is in this meeting. The poor fellow, he had to catch him a ride. <laughs> you had to bring him. You had to bring him. If he's here, you brought him. But God is already here. He's God in heaven. He's God on earth. He's God everywhere. Which are in heaven. And then we were taught that a letter, there was a greeting or salutation. And the greeting or salutation you use depends upon what you think about the person to whom you're writing. If you're writing Mary, and Mary is just a casual friend, you're satisfied to just say, Dear Mary. But brother, if you love Mary, you will spend about an hour and a half trying to find another name sweeter than this name Mary. Somebody here knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know what her name is? Why don't you go and put it down there? But no, you want a name sweeter than that name. The greeting or salutation in this prayer letter is hallowed be thy name. This name is holy. This name is to be respected. This name is to be hallowed. Oh, I get disturbed when I hear people and some of them call themselves Christians. And when they get ready to use vulgarity and profanity and swear, so we can get that holy name and drag it down through the field. Oh, that name is holy. It's an excellent name. Don't you know that's the only name that can save us? Don't you know that's the only name you can pray in? That's the only name that we can meet in. The name Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Hallowed be thy name. And then we were taught uh, that uh, when you start off the body of the letter, always express some interest in the one to whom you're writing. Don't start off talking about yourself. Express some interest in him. Those of us who have been away from home, possibly in school, and we needed something, it didn't take us long to learn how to ask about the other sisters and brothers and the aunts and the uncles, and then go on and tell them to send you a hundred dollars. <laughs> always, always express some interest in the one to whom you're writing. You're to start this prayer letter off by saying, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And then when you've expressed some interest in him, then go on and ask him for what you want. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation. And then we were taught that there is a complimentary close. And the complimentary close differs from the greeting of salutation in that now you can't figure out who you are. <laughs> when we get down to that complimentary close, we'll say, I am your, <laughs> and you'll spend another hour trying to figure out who you are. I am your, uh, I am your, uh, and then finally when you arrive at it, uh, you put something like always and uh, forever and ever, and you'll underscore it two or three times and put some exclamation points there. Now, you may change your mind tomorrow, but for now it's forever <laughs> and ever. Well, thine, the complimentary clothes. And I got to close it here. The complimentary close is, Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Thine is the kingdom. Who ever heard of a kingdom without a king? You know, everybody's got a king. Who is your king? If when I ask you who is your king, you ask me who is mine. You got a minute? <laughs> well, my king is the only one qualified to be king. My king has always been king. You know, these other kings, they were born a prince and had to wait till the father died or the mother, if she was a ruling mother, wait until she died and then become king. But my king was born king. In fact, the Bible says he's a seven-way king. He's a king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. Oh, my king will let you know Who's who and what's what? <laughs> I told you a few minutes ago about being invited by the President of the United States to be his guest in the White House. Now, now, you please pardon me, that may not mean a thing to you. This might be an everyday occurrence. <laughs> but for a black boy born down in Robertson County, Texas, and the people shoved him around and they thought he was retarded and said he'd never amount to anything. Oh, and the Lord picked me up. And, and the Lord built me up. And, and the Lord saved me. And then the Lord make a preacher out of me. And then have the President of the United States to invite me to be his guest in the White House. That meant something to me. You know, for about two months after that visit, everybody I talked with, I'd weave the conversation around, you know, <laughs> to let them know I'd been to the White House. I'd tell them how good I felt being guarded by the same security officers as the President of the United States. I told them how good I felt sitting there talking to the President face to face for three hours and fifteen minutes, sir. I told him how good I felt. Well, <laughs> now that was in, that was in March. In September, September that same year, I was in Rome. And I was scheduled to leave the two days before the president would arrive. And I rearranged my itinerary. I said, I'm going to stay right here until my king comes. I'm going to stay right here until my president gets here. I didn't think I'd get a chance to see him, but I just want to have it said that I was in Rome at the same time the president was. And while I was going around sightseeing, I saw a letter on the wall. Nixon, Rome will be your grave. I said, uh oh, I got out of there and went on down in Africa. <laughs> I went on down to Africa. I found out, I found out that 
after my husband king couldn't do me any good. I found out somebody else had to protect him. I found out that under certain conditions uh, somebody had to rescue him. Then that made me draw close to my son of king. Oh, my king always has been king and always will be king. Oh, my king is, well, David said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. That's my king. <laughs> no means of measure can define his limitless love. That's my king. <laughs> no far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his soulless supplies. That's my king. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. Nobody can keep him from saving me. Nobody can keep him. I don't care what you tell him about me. He knows me. Yeah, there's no barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. That's my king. And what I like about it, he doesn't need me. And he doesn't need you. He stands in the solitude of himself. He's August and he's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is supreme and preeminent. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He is the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. He's in every way able to satisfy every need, your need and mine, and everybody's need simultaneously. He can hear all of us pray at the same time. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. Now that's my king. Well, do you know him? Do you know him? Hey! Do you know him? That's my king. Well, I ask you, do you know him? He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of Lords. That's my king. Is he yours? What I like about him, his office is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you, but he, he's in the sun. Well, he, he, 
He's indescribable. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, the heavens of heavens cannot contain him, let alone a man explaining it. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Hey! That's my king. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Oh, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. What are you talking about? I'm an heir of salvation. Purchase of God. I've been born of his spirit. I've been lost in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Thine is the kingdom and the power. He's got all power. And the glory. You're trying to get glory and honor for yourself, but it's his. <laughs> and the glory forever. And ever. And ever. And ever. And ever. How long is that? And ever. And when you get through with all of the forevers, then amen. We were taught, we were taught that the letter is not binding, it's not yours. Until you affix your signature. Anybody can type it out for you. But until you sign it, it's not yours. Amen is the signature to this prayer letter. Now you can say all of that other. But if you can't say amen, I'm talking about if you can't let him have his way in your life, it doesn't mean a thing. Amen. Now we just having a rehearsal down here. We are just practicing. We just here tonight practicing. What are we going to do when we get on the other side? Now look, if you can't act right in the rehearsal, you're not going to be in the performance. Well, you know, I, I, I wonder how some people think they, they're going to get to heaven and sit there still and, and quite you going to get run over. Are going to be moving. That's yes, sir. You know, in Southwestern Seminary, they taught me how to stand in the same track. They taught me how to hold my Bible. They taught me how to gesture. To, to emphasize my points if I had any. <laughs> and then they even taught me how to regulate and modulate my voice so it wouldn't be so loud and obnoxious. <laughs> and do you know I passed the course? <laughs> Whoa! But when I get to thinking about Jesus, I can't help but get excited. When I think about Jesus, who saved me, I can't hear him, but get loud. I can't help but shout. Maybe you don't have anything to shout about, but I have. If you just, if you, do you think I'm shouting now? You just wait. You just wait until my feet strike Zion. 
you just wait until I behold his face. You just wait until I hear him say, Sir, well done. You haven't seen any shout. Oh, you know, we have a time down here trying to find a song that suits everybody. If you repeat the same song within a month, you're going to hear it grumbling all over the congregation. <laughs> Why don't you sing something else? I don't like that. <laughs> You've got a song and I've got a song and all of God's children got a song. Well, but when we get over there, we're going to sing one song. <laughs> amen, amen, and amen. <laughs> Will you be there? Let the Lord have his way in your life now.